context of law events were set up in order to provide for student barristers, barristers, judges, benchers, the retired, but most importantly, the public as well, discussions involving high level, or very senior members of the inn, and we have two of those with us tonight, and occasionally people who we would like to persuade to come and help us, and we've got one of those tonight as well. The topic of tonight's uh, discussion or debate, however it turns out to be, is the succession of prime ministers without there being a general election. And as I think you'll hear very soon, and certainly throughout the discussion, this is a long-standing issue, and for some, a long-standing problem. How can it be if you elect someone, you find yourself so soon subject to leadership by someone selected, maybe by members of parliament, maybe by members of a political party. And that person might have, good gracious me, quite a lot of effect on you, which you hadn't bargained for at the general election, even in 40 days, for example. So that's the discussion. And there's only one rule that we operate in these events, and that is that when it comes to question and answer, Q&A, we hope you will ask questions. We hope you will not introduce yourselves, because although we don't, we're not interested in you in that sense, we're not, not interested in you, it just takes time. And please don't thank the speakers, because they know we're going to do that at the end, and so that's duplication. And what works much better is if you think in your head and sub-edit down your question to 30 seconds or less, and that will drive the debate forward. And if you go over 30 seconds, you may find that the moderator will cut you off. Which brings me to our three distinguished speakers. Um, our first speaker and the guest of the inn, a non-member, as it were, is Professor Curtis. Now, Sir John Curtis, from time to time, amongst those interested in politics, becomes the most famous and the most sought after person in, in the country. And he may not like that imposed fame, but he wears it extremely well. And you may think that the frequency of his becoming, having that spotlight thrown on him, is in some ways a reflection of the quality, or maybe otherwise, of the political system of which he commentates. But he is, of course, primarily a professor of politics and enormously able to help us in this difficult issue. The next speaker is David Liddington, an MP for a very long time, great experience in cabinet and ministerial positions, and I think elected seven times altogether, no doubt some of those with overlapping or changing prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> Expressing ourselves briefly, you can look up these distinguished people and see all the many things they've done and credits that they've got. But I think I can honestly say for the bar that although David Liddington's time as Lord Chancellor was comparatively short, even by today's standards, <laughs> <laughs> he was much welcomed when he became Lord Chancellor the subject of great affection when he was Lord Chancellor, and the subject of great regret when he ceased to be Lord Chancellor. Our moderator this evening is Lord Hunt of the Wirral. Um, again, a very long, extremely distinguished political career, again with new and changing prime ministers in his time. He left office as a prime minister a long time ago and has been in the House of Lords ever since, sometimes representing the Conservative Party, I believe, but other than that, engaged on many important issues and indeed for both the Inn and for the Bar Standards Board that controls the Bar, having been important, very important, in the preparation of various reports. So there it is. I'll hand over 
to Lord Hunt with just this final observation. At the end of it all, they'll all be tethered at a reception outside. They'll be tethered to tables. They won't be able to move. So if you have things you want to ask them, providing you make sure they've got a drink at the table, you will be able to do that. Lord Hunt. Well, first of all, uh, Master Nice, thank you very much indeed for your kind introduction. Well, what an exciting time to explore this subject of should our constitution protect against party elected leaders. Now, that's the title. It's set in the context, of course, of prime ministers taking office without a general election. I don't know why I'm moderating, because I don't feel at all moderate about this subject, because it's dogged my life. I first got inspired into, if I'm allowed, just a couple of words. Um, I first got inspired into politics and party politics by the chancellor of my university in Bristol, Winston Churchill, who I adored and worshipped. And I still have all those wonderful communications he used to send me when he urged me on to pursue debating. Public speaking for him was the most important opportunity. But of course, he said quite a bit about this subject. If I quote one of his phrases, it has been said, I won't try and copy his wonderful voice. It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all the others that have been tried. He also said the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> and when you look at the background, of course, because of his influence, I attended my first party conference in 1963. And I turned up at the Conservative Party conference after Joe Grimmond, who had followed uh, Clement Davis, wasn't it, yes. who resigned uh, uh, in 1956. There were only three MPs. And because he was chief whip, Joe Grimmond emerged as the leader. But he had just held the Liberal Party conference where he said, we must march towards the sound of gunfire. Harold Wilson, who, by the way, challenged his leader, Hugh Gateskill, um, in 1960, uh, but eventually took his place, had been to the Labour conference and said, we are moving into the white heat of the technological age. And I turned up at the Conservative Party conference in Blackpool to find my leader, Harold Macmillan, sent in a sick note. <laughs> and, and therefore, my experience of politics didn't start on a very high note. But then, of course, we got into this whole procedure in 63 of, at the party conference, everyone said, well, who's going to take this? This guy's resigned. He thought he was going to die. In fact, he lasted for many years to come and should never have resigned. But he, um, he obviously was set against Rab Butler at the time. So he promoted uh, Quinton Hogg as his replacement. And we all wore Q badges. And there was a tremendous surge. Um, but the Rab Butler supporters countered this and emerged out of the darkness uh, the Earl of Hume. <laughs> and so Alec Douglas Hume hadn't been elected by anyone, but apparently the late Queen was advised um, uh, to send for Sir Alec Douglas Hume, just as Harold Macmillan, following the resignation of Eden, had emerged from a conversation between the late Queen and Winston Churchill and the Marquis of Salisbury who advised the Queen to send for Harold Macmillan. So the Queen was again advised to send for Sir Alec Douglas Hume. So therefore, you can see immediately that I take to this subject like a duck to water, because it's been a, a part of my uh, parliamentary life um, 
for the last 50 years. And 50 years in Parliament has seen some ups and downs. <laughs> but my goodness, never has it come into a situation where we, in one year we had three prime ministers. And we had so much change that it was almost impossible uh, to absorb. But anyway, we are going to have an opportunity for Q&A, both from the in-person audience and those online. You are kindly asked, I'm told, to keep your questions brief, unlike this opening set of remarks, to enable as many questions uh, as possible in the time available before meeting the speakers over a drink in the adjoining reception space. Thanks to research by the library team, a comprehensive reading list relating to tonight's topic can be found in the reception area, which will also be circulated to everyone here, all attendees, with a recording of the discussion in the next couple of days. But shall we get underway? Sir John, would you like to open? Sir John Curtis. Thank you very much, Lord Hunt. Um, Thank you also to uh, the Treasurer and the Inner Temple for the uh, invitation to speak. Um, I am a mere political scientist, the kind of social science graduate that Jacob, Jacob B. Smog uh, doesn't think it's worth having, but I'm pleased <laughs> to see that there are a number of you in this room who uh, disagree with uh, the noble politician. Um, as has already been referred to, in a sense, the reason why this debate has been stimulated this evening is the sight of just over 140,000 people, or perhaps more accurately, only 140,000 people, deciding who should become the next prime minister in the summer of last year, only for the decision to be overturned within a matter of weeks and the loser declared the winner. Um, inevitably, that somewhat improbable sequence of events uh, has made people ask about whether or not having party members elect leaders is wise. It's also particularly become an issue because the Conservative Party has now used this procedure twice while in office. And I'm, of course, also duty bound to advise you that the SNP for the first time uh, earlier this year had a member party members ballot to decide the person whom they call their convener, but the leader of the SNP. Um, and that was the first time that Scotland's first minister was decided uh, by that uh, method. So why do we, why might we worry about this? What are the criticisms? Well, I'm going to suggest that there are three criticisms that are commonly made. One is that in the case of a prime minister, at least it's undemocratic, that um, it should be decided by anybody other than the electorate. So prime ministers should be directly elected. The second is that irrespective of whether a party is in office or is in opposition, that basically it's a less effective way of identifying the person who is most likely to be a good leader, that MPs in the end know best, and so they're the ones who work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. They know their foibles, they know their secrets, perhaps. Um, they uh, certainly uh, know whether or not there's somebody they can get on with. The third uh, uh, criticism is that it is unrepresentative, that those who do vote in these party membership elections are not typical of the public, or indeed perhaps even of the people who vote for the party in question. So I'm going to look at some of these. Some of them I'm going to suggest have, don't have much merit, others do. Um, but so you know where I'm going, I'm going to turn the question around towards the end and suggest that probably we do need to keep party membership ballots, but we actually also need to introduce MPs into the process of certainly electing a prime minister in a way that at the moment they do not have any role at all. Uh, and you'll see how I'll get there uh, in a moment. So first of all, it's undemocratic. We shouldn't change prime ministers without election. Well, I'm terribly sorry, but we have a parliamentary system of government. And under parliamentary systems of government, uh, prime ministers need to be able to maintain the confidence of the House of Commons. And if you actually go through the history of prime ministers since 1918, of the 36 people who either for the first time or for a subsequent occasion 
um, entered into office. 23 of them first acquired office, not as a result of winning an election, but as a result of taking over from their predecessor. Only 13 of them have uh, come into office as a result of an election. And then of those 23, only two of them went to the country almost immediately uh, on becoming prime minister, that is Sir Anthony Eden and uh, Bona Law. So the truth is that every time you hear a politician get up and say, we well, should have an election, we should have an election, you just go, they need to learn A, their constitution, and B, uh, their history. Um, now, of course, what is true, and in a sense, this is where, uh, perhaps in some senses, we're seeing the unintended consequences of changes. All, the, all of our parties have, in fact, initially introduced leadership elections while they were in opposition. It started, by the way, with the Liberal Party back in 1976. This was the first party to have an election. Now, in that case, you know, it, there were only six of them, all right? And when Jeremy Corbyn, uh, not Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Thorpe, um, <laughs> Freudian slip. Uh, when, when Jeremy Thorpe uh, resigned in, shall we say, in, in, in the not the most propitious of circumstances, uh, the, um, it was decided that perhaps actually uh, just allowing six people or really five people once you took away Jeremy Thorpe to be able to decide who should be the leader of the Liberal Party didn't uh, really work. So that's where it started. Then Labour uh, doing it in 1981 once they were in opposition. And of course, the Conservatives introduced it finally in 2001 uh, when they were in opposition. So in a sense, these are parties when in opposition who in a sense, up to them how to decide who was going to be their leader uh, but then, of course, it does mean we find that then they're using that internal procedure to elect somebody who then assumes the office of a prime stroke first minister. But basically, given a parliamentary system, the leader is going to be the person who, who, who becomes prime minister, however they reach office. Second thing, it's ineffective that MPs know best. Now, here um, there is certainly a crucial kernel of truth. Certainly that what is crucial for leaders is that they have to be able to maintain the confidence of their parliamentary colleagues. And in the end, it, with the exception of Jeremy Corbyn in 2016, it doesn't really matter what the rules are. I um, mean, in the end, Boris Johnson went because his government collapsed. Liz Truss went because she got the message that she, uh, she couldn't say. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was uh, initially, in a sense, formally uh, uh, not given a renewal of office, but then she, she, she read the messages. Um, Duncan, Sir Duncan, uh, Duncan Smith, Theresa May, uh, Charles Kennedy for the Liberal Democrats, I mean, Campbell in 2007. These are all people who, in the end, resigned because they knew they no longer had the support of their parliamentary colleagues. So to that extent, at least, having a degree of support amongst your parliamentary colleagues is crucial. Now, of course, parties try to deal with this by um, having, uh, in the case of the Conservative Party, you MPs get it down to the top two. That's one way of dealing with it. Uh, the other way of dealing with the Labour Party says, well, let's have a minimum number of MPs who accept or uh, nominate somebody. The trouble is so many Labour MPs thought that Jeremy Corbyn didn't have a chance but they put them on the ballot anyway. And then of course, much to their horror, uh, they won in 2015. But equally, one can also see, um, if you look at the people who became leaders without clearly being endorsed by their parliamentary colleagues, i.e. Ian Duncan Smith, Liz Truss, um, um, and indeed Ed Miliband, that these are all ones where they didn't get a majority of their colleagues, or they weren't the, the, the top of the two candidates. Uh, they're ones which in the end, well, two of them resigned, and the other one, in a sense, his lack of authority wasn't helped by the way he acquired um, office. So um, to that extent, at least, there is certainly a lot of merit in saying that MPs should have a role. And I'm going to come back uh, to this, as I said, towards the end. But the third uh, accusation is that um, basically party members are unrepresentative and in particular the accusation often is made is that they are extreme. Now certainly one thing that is true and arguably is a problem is that our political parties tend to have diminishing memberships, that's certainly true of the Conservative Party, 
The first conservative leadership election back in 2001 had about a quarter of a million people who actually turned out and participated. The last time, as I said earlier, it was less than 150,000. Um, so to that extent, at least, one could argue that you know, it's, it's increasingly being reliant on a relatively small number of people. But a lot of the criticism comes from what we in the political science trade call May's curvilinear uh, law of disparity, which is the idea basically that the sensible folk are the voters, the unsensible extremists are the activists, the party members, and the MPs perhaps aren't quite as sensible as the voters, but for the most part, because at the end they know that their job depends on the voters, they tend at least to listen to the sensible folk, even if they're not always necessarily sensible by inclination. The trouble with this is, however, is that again, the boring research that my academic trade occasionally engages in does not suggest that this is correct. Uh, Pippa Norris back in 1992 found, for example, that on issues like nationalization, and taxation and spending and welfare, that it's the Conservative MPs who are at one end of the spectrum and the Labour MPs at the other end of the spectrum. And actually, yes, although their activists may be more left and right wing respectively than their voters, it's the MPs who are the ideologues. Much more recently, Adam Wager and colleagues have demonstrated that in the Conservative Party at the moment, um, MP, uh, Conservative MPs are just so much more economically liberal than everybody else. It's Tory MPs above all who have angst about the fact that the Conservative Party since 2019 has presided over a considerable expansion of the state and a considerable rise uh, in spending. Equally on the Labour side, it's Labour MPs above all who are ideologically socially liberal. So the truth is, if you're concerned about MP uh, leaders being elected by folk whose views are not necessarily representative, the last group of people you would give the election to is MPs. <laughs> um, and let's remember here, you know, it was Labour MPs who elected Michael Foote in 1980. There was no, it was, it was MP election. And Jeremy Corbyn actually in the end did get almost 50% of the vote amongst MPs. Um, uh, let alone um, everybody else, and he would certainly have won uh, if we'd if he'd had uh, if we'd had an exhaustive ballot. So MPs have a role as people who, in the end, leaders need support from, but don't necessarily want to give the choice simply to MPs. So how am I going to square the circle? Well, I want to draw you to what I think is another is a gap in our constitutional uh, convention stroke law. And that is, the honest truth is at the moment, this is the great secret, although Lord Hunt effectively referred to it, nobody elects the Prime Minister. Nobody at all casts a single vote for a Prime Minister. The Crown appoints somebody whom the Crown thinks will be able to command the confidence of the House of Commons. All right? Um, and in some occasions, it's not necessarily obvious, as in the case of 1963. Um, the Commons, by convention, although not necessarily by law, can get rid of a Prime Minister via vote of no confidence. Um, but as already said, MPs effectively have their own internal ways of doing it. It's worth contrasting the situation with the situation in both Scotland and Wales in the devolved institutions. So, yes, SNP MPs sorry, members, decided they wanted Humza Yusuf as their leader, but then Humza Yusuf had to be elected by uh, MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. Um, and I think arguably, and at the end of the day, if a majority party finds it doesn't like what the, M what the members have decided, if we have a formal vote of MPs, at least in theory, it is open to them to say no we're going to have, uh, we're in favor of having somebody else. So uh, I want to suggest that probably we have to end up keeping the choice amongst members. But if in the end of the day, for example, another Jeremy Corbyn type figure comes along whom MPs really cannot stand, well, we give them a vote and they can vote, uh, they can vote, uh, not vote for the person uh, to become prime minister 
that their party has chosen at leader. They at least have then have, have got the choice and they've got the final say. Well, God. So the title uh, of the discussion is Should Our Constitution Protect Against Party Elected Leaders? I think, Sir John, you've slightly widened the, and, and perhaps uh, extended the topic. So now it's up to David Liddington to respond. David. Well, uh, David, David, thank you very much. And um, thank you to the Treasurer for the invitation to take part in the discussion this evening. And I think John Curtis has given us a masterclass in how to quietly and subtly change the terms of the, <laughs> the, the question. I, I, I think that any member of the cabinet would benefit from, from listening to John's approach before their next appearance on the Today programme. <laughs> um, the, I, I mean, I think that the, let me, let me sort of summarise where I come from on this. Um, I think that there's certainly a case for constitutional reforms of various kinds. I think that there's, I'll say a little bit at the end of my remarks, the, the power of the executive at the expense of parliament has increased and ought to be subjected to further checks. And I don't think that we can simply rely on conventions uh, and uh, customs uh, uh, in, in uh, so doing. Secondly, I think the question of whether members of political parties um, should or should not take part in the election of a party leader, including of a leader who becomes prime minister because that party has a majority in the House of Commons, is largely a red herring. I mean, it is a, it is a political matter um, of which I have views, but, but which I don't think is central to the constitutional question involved. Um, and it is certainly my view that the decision about who becomes prime minister and how long an individual serves as prime minister between elections uh, must constitutionally remain with members of the House of Commons. Now, of course, historically, prime ministers in our country were the personal choice of the sovereign. Um, it was the sovereign would pick the man, I mean, until 1979 always was the man, um, who uh, was both congenial to that sovereign. I mean, George III, notoriously, you know, clung on to Butte and then to, to, later to Lord North, even though um, they were not necessarily the uh, uh, most e effective um, masters of the House of Commons, uh, or the House of, House of Lords at, at the time. Um, and, but also, of course, they wanted the person who could command the majority, as well as being personally congenial to the monarch, because they relied upon Parliament ever since William III's wars in the late 17th century uh, to vote through supply, to impose taxation on citizens uh, so that the business of the state could be carried on. And so having majority in the House of Commons after the settlement of 1660, 16. 889 uh, was absolutely essential from the point of view of the, the monarch. And originally, you go back to the 18th century, the term prime minister was an insult. It, it, it was uh, a, a term designed to accuse somebody of seeking to accrue um, semi dictatorial, vice regal power. And the office of prime minister was not even mentioned in an act of parliament until the early 20th century, and then in the context of the act which provided for the gift of checkers by Lord Lee to the nation for the use of the Prime Minister in office at that time. Until then, the, the, the office of Prime Minister was just not recognised anywhere in statute. And so the, the King or Queen's First Minister, their Prime Minister, was the man who could command a majority in the Commons. And as John Curtis said, it was perfectly normal for the Prime Minister to change between elections. And we used that, of course, to have a, uh, a requirement uh, whereby 
when a backbench member of the House of Commons became a minister, they had to resign their seat and fight a by-election uh, in, in order to be confirmed in Churchill. In, in Churchill yeah. lost uh, in one, one of those uh, those contests in the early 20th century. Um, but you look at the, the list just in the 20th century. I mean, I think it's about eight eight prime ministers um, took office for the first time, having won a general election victory. Um, Campbell Bannerman, Ramsay MacDonald, though one could argue a little bit about how decisive that was in the 20s, um, but Attlee, Wilson, Heath, Thatcher, Blair, Cameron. You go through the rest, and they all succeeded an incumbent without an election. Balfour, Asquith, Lloyd George, Bonner Law, Baldwin, Chamberlain, Churchill, Eden, Macmillan, Hume, Callaghan, Major, Brown, May, Johnson, Trust, Sunak. <laughs> the disparity is obvious, but if you go back to the 19th century, um, certainly the 18th century, you, you will find at least a comparable pattern. And that reflects the constitutional reality that voters elect a House of Commons. And it's the House of Commons with that mandate from the electors, which then decides who the prime minister should be. And we have to have a mechanism in our system for dealing with what happens if either a prime minister loses the confidence of the commons or a prime minister resigns for other reasons on grounds, for example, of ill health uh, or, or death in office. I mean, that has not happened in, in recent times, but it is clearly something you look at other democracies around the world that has happened from time to time. Uh, and we need a mechanism to replace the man or woman in charge. And what happened, I would argue, in 2022 was actually an example of the Constitution working. Uh, it was turbulent. It was pretty, it looked pretty chaotic. But actually what happened was that you had first one and then a second prime minister who lost the confidence of the majority of the House of Commons, who were, in the case of Boris Johnson, unable to put together an effective administration because people refused to serve in it. And the constitution did its work. And first he and later on his trusts were effectively deposed by members of parliament. That was the system working. And I think the electorate, for the most part, tends to share the view of um, Brenda from Bristol. Um, the famous interview at the time of the, when the 2017 election was called by Theresa May, had a microphone stuck in front of her and said, what do you think about this election? How are you going to vote? And she just stared at the interviewer and said, not another one. <laughs> uh, and, and most people, you know, know it's their duty to vote, but they don't want to be troubled uh, to go to the ballot box um, more frequently than necessary. Political parties, in my view, are a necessary part of a mass democracy. Having seen this from the inside, I can argue with great confidence that without the discipline and the cohesion that membership of a political party imposes, it will be impossible for any government of any political stripe to get anything through. Imagine a House of Commons of 650 independents and trying to take any unpopular but necessary decision in the national interest. It would not happen. I've seen it firsthand, particularly as deputy to Theresa May, is what happens when a government loses its overall majority or has just a tiny one. The prime minister of the day then ends up in a constant week by week or day by day process of negotiation with this or that group of backbenchers. And the political party provides, even in those circumstances, at least some hope that consistent government can be carried on. Our first past the post system, of course, also drives the creation of political parties that present themselves as a broad church that, um, in effect, uh, amount to coalitions formed in advance of an election presented to the electorate to choose between at a general election. You go around most other European democracies, which have 
one of, of, of the various proportional systems, and you will see many more political parties and the negotiations taking place after the election in Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Italy, or elsewhere. Now, we, we need to have a system not just that provides for the resignation, illness, or death of a prime minister in office, but a system which, in picking a successor mid-term, protects the sovereign from being dragged into party politics. When we look back at 1963, which David Hunt uh, referred to, you know, and Harold Macmillan, you know, the Queen going to Harold Macmillan's um, sickbed to take his advice about who his successor should be, and Macmillan uh, is known to loathe Rab Butler, um, and the and the punt for Alec Hume and other party elders supported that, and that came very very close to pulling the sovereign into a an essentially political with a capital P decision. So, whereas I do think that um, in the context of an election that fails to deliver a decisive majority for one party or the other, there is merit in the system that some of the other European democracies have of uh, a wise man or woman being appointed to act on behalf of the sovereign to test out who might be able to put a coalition or a working majority together in the House of Commons. I think that have a, where a majority exists, having uh, a decision very clearly left to the political party concerned, either through its MPs alone or through its MPs and its party members, is the best way to protect the king from uh, party, partisan controversy. I mean, the irony of, of, of bringing party members into these decisions was that it was seen certainly by my party. I remember the discussion in 1997. Um, and I think by the Labour Party too, as a means to try to make it more attractive for people to become party members and to broaden the membership base and make it more diverse at a time when all parties were and continue to be worried about how reluctant most people are to join parties and the narrowing and aging of the party base. Now, my view is that you know, it was tried, it was, was, mechanism was tried in good faith, but I don't think it has actually worked very well. But I don't think you can ban parties from enfranchising their members. Um, and in any case, the fact that party members, and uh, in most circumstances under our system, play the key role in selecting or deselecting candidates to be members of parliament means that there would always be that that uh, possibility of revenge. Now we could, as John Curtis argued, require a positive vote in the House of Commons uh, to endorse a new prime minister and cabinet uh, whenever that changed without an election or even after a general election too. That is what happens in Germany. In Germany, after each election, when a coalition uh, is formed after usually some weeks of talks, a coalition programme published, and that then goes to a formal vote in the Bundestag to approve or disapprove the candidate to be Chancellor at the head of that coalition government. Um, but it is al already possible for a motion of no confidence to be tabled when a new government is formed. Um, and I'm, while I'm not hostile to John's suggestion, I'm not sure that it is quite, it, it really is, is, is a, a revolutionary move, though I can see that requiring Parliament to take a positive decision uh, might be a step forward. The argument I would say needed to be considered against that is that if we hypothesize the circumstances where a man or woman had just been elected by their party to succeed the, the, the outgoing prime minister. Can one really envisage um, the MPs from that party to within a week deciding to defy the will of um, 
their, their, their colleagues or their, their um, party members. And the vote, of course, would be public in the House of Commons, quite properly so. So uh, you know, if I voted you know, to reject my party's candidate and I knew that my local uh, uh, Conservative Party had been in favour of that candidate, would I, you know, how, how brave would I be? In those circumstances, so I think that there's some, there are some sort of tricky issues there. Where there is a case for change, I think, is in in other matters. I think what our experience over a number of years, and particularly over the last three, is that convention, the 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 good boy sort of theory of um, how government is, is is done, the good chat theory, is not something that is sufficient any longer, and. I, I think that, um, as I said, I think the idea of the wise man or woman is something we should consider. But if we're looking for constitutional changes that might make a difference and might do something to rebuild public trust in our system, I would say we need to look again at how we program the time allotted to individual bills, where too often that is used by the government of the day, Labour and Conservative, I've seen it happen, as a means to restrict debate on things the government would prefer were not debated and for ill drafted legislation to be rushed through the commons only to be largely rewritten when it comes to the house of lords um, i think we could look at enhancing the power of select committees to uh, confirm major public sector appointments um, i think that we could uh, look at certainly greater devolution within England, I'd argue Scotland and Wales too, of uh, both administrative powers and to some extent powers to tax. And we could have a new Parliament Act, which defined the, um, the, the powers and responsibilities of a reformed upper chamber, uh, which could, for example, uh, give it enhanced power to delay or even to block certain categories of legislation, perhaps specific powers over statutory instruments which often get um, inadequate scrutiny, to put it mildly, perhaps even to define in law a class of constitutional statutes and say that as with the Quinquennial Act now, the upper chamber's assent would be required if those um, constitutional statutes were to be amended or repealed. So I think that there is a really significant agenda for constitutional reform and for debate about the relationship between executive and legislature but i think that this particular question of who it is that should approve uh, uh the change of prime minister between general elections is a very very minor aspect of that debate thank you <laughs> See, according to the agenda I've been given, while you're thinking of what questions you're going to pose to these two eminent individuals, I am uh, supposed just to fill in a few moments while you're thinking with some carefully thought through questions of my own. Having heard the two speeches, I'm now totally confused. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, we don't have a constitution, so it is quite difficult to work out what our constitution should do to protect against party elected leaders. But in a weak moment, Master Liddington did mention that we do have two houses of Parliament when he referred to the House of Lords. Now, I just happen to be a member of the House of Lords, <laughs> so I would just like to ask, do we should we regard the House of Lords as being those on the touchline, watching this scenario slowly move forward? Should we, in fact, give the House of Lords more power to control uh, the system under which the party elects leaders? Should the House of Lords be required to approve? And what right have they got to ask that? I just finally, Sir John, asking you to comment first. It is the House of Lords at the moment under the rule bill, that's the retained EU law revocation and renewal bill, 
that he's actually saying to the government, you can't do this. You can't allow all the EU laws to fall over a cliff at the end of this year. And the government is starting to recognize that there is a House of Lords. But what role under the Constitution should the House of Lords take, or Sir John, is Keir Starmer right when he says he's going to abolish the House of Lords? Sir John. OK. Um, uh, Master Linton accused me of s somewhat expanding the subject of the evening. Um, <laughs> I am tempted to suggest that he has done that in Spain. But anyway. um, so I'm going to bring us slightly further back. And I'm going to answer your question, particularly with reference to um, the role of the House of Lords um, with respect to the election of leaders. And then maybe we'll come, up, we'll come back to the wider subject. Um, and let me just first of all say one point in direct in response to Sir David. He's absolutely right. What I was suggesting is not revolutionary. It is a way of always insulating the Crown against political matters. In other words, the House of Commons has to sort it out for itself. You therefore, I mean, you might, uh, the Cabinet Secretary might take on the role of formateur, but frankly, the Crown doesn't need to have to do anything at all. It simply needs to be, now, the, of course, what you can do, um, which is what is designed to concentrate minds in the devolved institutions, is the clock ticks. You've got 30 days in which to elect yes. somebody. And if you don't elect one 30 days, it's another election. And I'm sure that will be a wonderful discipline to ensure that somehow or another the House of Commons found, uh, found somebody. And that's certainly the discipline that the House of Commons, when it passed the devolved uh, 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 legislation, thought was required for the devolved institution. They come back directly to your question. Um, so, so far as the question of whether or not members of the House of Lords should have some particular privileged role with respect to the election of party leaders, I would suggest to you it is probably... The answer to that question is probably bound up in the question of what, how, what the House of Lords should consist of. So I suspect that many people, um, you know, valuable though many of us will acknowledge the work of the Lord, House of Lords is currently constituted is, you've cited one example, um, the idea that uh, 800 people appointed, in many of them by the current party leader or some previous party leader to that institution, uh, should have a particular role in the democratic election of a party leader might cite them as a lot. On the other hand, if we had an elected House of Lords and following the precedent of the Labour Party, which the well, Labour Party's requirement is that uh, you have to be nominated by 15% of parliamentarians, well, when we were still inside the European Union, that included Labour MEPs as well as Labour MPs. So if we switched to an elected House of Lords, I could certainly envisage that um, the House, the elected members of the House of Lords, either could uh, be required for nomination. You might even, in the case of the Conservative Party, want to have an indicative ballot of some kind. Decide to say to people, "This is what uh, Conservative members of the of the House of Lords think." But I think, in truth, um, the House of Lords, or whatever we might call it, once it's elected, probably is only going to be thought to be uh, uh, going to should be given that right once it itself is subject the rigors of election. Hmm. Now, uh, Sir David, um, can I extend the question to you, uh, not only your throwaway remark about the House of Lords, but also uh, when you now um, look forward to the way in which uh, Parliament's going to evolve, particularly with the levelling up bill, devolution, the need to push more power into local communities, um, when we look at the way in which our constitution lays down a general election um, within five years, but at the discretion of the prime minister, you did flirt, didn't you, with the idea of a five-year fixed-term mm. parliament and the fact that 650 um, MPs should be reduced um, <laughs> Certainly to 600. Would you like to tell me how all that fits into your concept of what we do under the Constitution? Yes, I mean, let me let me uh, come, come, let me come, deal with those first, and then I'll perhaps come to the the, the, the House of Lords point. Um, I think that the um, 
I mean, certainly the Fixed Term Parliament Act was brought in um, when we had the first peacetime coalition um, in, in 2010 as an insurance policy. Both sides were fearful that the other one would rat on any coalition agreement at the earliest opportunity and try to go to the country in the hope of winning more seats and dishing their coalition partner. Um, I think it was, again, it was, I remember discussing it with David Cameron at the time, and you know, he, he, the very powerful reasons for doing it. The weakness of that approach was shown uh, in the, in, in sort of 2017 to 19, when both Theresa May and then Boris Johnson, for sort of the, the first months of his premiership, were stuck because they couldn't threaten MPs by saying, look, if you don't get into at least take a decision on this, then I'm going to go to the country and ask the country to endorse uh, uh, the policy that I, I want to pursue. Um, and, and so you were in this state of limbo where, where it was impossible for anything to move on a policy matter where a decision needed to be taken. I happen to disagree vehemently with where Boris Johnson was coming from on this, but a decision was needed. And it was summed up when the House of Commons had indicative votes on the form of Brexit they wanted, and there was a majority against every option. Um, so uh, I, I think that there was there wasn't a need to um, to revert to the the old system. It's not perfect, but I, I think that the, the, the weakness was shown uh, during that period. I mean, the the, the reduction of the number of MPs from six hundred and fifty to six hundred was a straightforward Cameron. Um, gesture to to, to, to to try to show that he was cutting the cost of politics. I mean, it was it was always going to head for trouble because um, and you know Turkeys were not going to vote for Christmas, and they were, they, they, you know, the people who thought they might be in the fifty to be axed uh, were going to do their utmost to block it, and more than fifty thought that they might be in the fifty. So so it was it was a uh, you know it, it was always uh, it was always on. I think David was on a hiding to nothing on on that one. I do. My lord, think that you, if I may, sort of say that you, you, you um, made one error at the start of your um, sort of uh, com ex cathedral comment to say we don't have a constitution. We don't have a single constitutional document. We have a constitution which is expressed through various acts of parliament, um, secondary piece of legislation, traditions customs and conventions, even I know, I'd say here, you know, the common law, I would say, is, of itself is a, uh, an element in our constitution. And we've seen in my lifetime through the evolution of the doctrine of judicial review, how the constitution can evolve through the courts as well as through the actions of the executive or the legislature. Um, I do think that, um, the, that we do need more devolution. I welcome what's in the leveling up legislation, I think perhaps for three reasons, very briefly. Um, first, because too many people feel deracinated uh, from politics at the moment and actually giving more power to take decisions to people who are close to them uh, in, an, in an area, a metropolis or a county where they, they feel some sense of belonging, uh, I think is, would be healthy for politics. Um, Secondly, with metro mayors, I have seen how they have a convening power to pull together uh, universities, um, trade unions, businesses, um, public uh, sector agencies in their locality and, and try to devise strategic approaches that are tailored to that particular part of the country. And third, because I mean, I saw in, when in the cabinet when you're looking at something like an industrial strategy or net zero, you can't micromanage this from Whitehall. Now you, can, you can and should be taking the big decisions at national level, but then actually implementing this in Sunderland or in Plymouth or in Herefordshire, you have to rely on people who are there on the ground locally. So I, it's another reason I think for great evolution. On the House of Lords, but I, I put my cards on the table. When I was in the Commons, whenever this came up, I voted for a wholly or partially elected upper house. I think the House members of the House of Lords do an incredible job at the moment, and they deserve nothing but um, praise for that. 
but I just think that for the reasons John Curtis gave, it's becoming more and more difficult to defend the basis on which the House of Lords is formed. Um, and it seems to me there are two models. You could either have a directly elected upper house on a franchise I would advocate, which is different from, and a different timetable from that of the House of Commons, um, or um, you could have an indirectly elected house. It's something that um, Lord Salisbury is championing, which is that you have an upper house that is drawn from the devolved um, regions and from local authorities throughout the United Kingdom. So it's more like the Bundesrat in, in the German system. Uh, and either of those you could make work. I think critically, I would limit its powers. I would define its powers, and I would limit its powers, partly because that's the only way to get any House of Commons to agree uh, to any sort of Lord's reform. Um, because they're terrified of something challenging the commons. Um, and secondly, to avoid gridlock. I, I don't think the United States is an example that we want to follow when this happens. But you look at other uh, bicameral democracies around the world, they seem to have found ways in which to operate with um, whole or partially elected upper chambers and for an allocation of powers that works in their systems. I don't see why it should be any different here. Hmm. Now, Sir John, I just, I'll just come back on a, on a couple of points or add something to, to, to what uh, Sir David said. Um, of course, the story of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act is that, as you indicated, uh, the, the Liberal Democrats certainly wanted it as yep. part of agreement. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was the Liberal Democrats who scuppered it in 2019 mm -hmm. by indicating to the Prime Minister that they'd be willing to vote in favour. Um, wh however, whether or not it, it, we should be back to a situation where the uh, Prime Minister, at his or her sole discretion, can call a dissolution. I think it is, is, is another matter. And that um, the, the honest truth is, even under the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, the House of Commons could always dissolve itself, which indeed is what it did in 2017, mm. if I remember correctly. Mm. Yes. Um, but so, uh, and arguably, uh, again, I would make the Prime Minister, I would make MPs themselves do the work. In the same way as I want MPs to do the dirty work of electing. Prime Minister, I also want MPs to do the dirty work of uh, dissolving the House if it's going to be dissolved early. Um, on devolution, I, I mean, you've demonstrated, uh, David, I mean, a, a long standing view that, you know, British government needs to be able to take effective action. So, my question to you is this so what do you mean by devolution? I think there are, there are two visions of devolution. One vision of devolution, which I think, frankly, is the view of devolution that is held by the current UK government, is we'll set the policy objectives and we look to you to implement them in your part of the United Kingdom. And inevitably, particularly in Scotland and in Wales, uh, this is a view of devolution that somewhat grates uh, with, with, with many. But certainly, uh, if you look at certainly much of what happens in terms of devolution in England, it, 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 you, know, you saw the rows that there were and the, the disagreements uh, during the COVID pandemic, when some of the metro mayors did dare to stand up and raise questions about the, the COVID strategy that was being being pursued by the government. So is it that, or do we, if we're going, really going to embrace devolution, accept that actually public policy, well, A, may, may differ from one part of the United Kingdom to another, and B, uh, insofar as coordination is required, it's coordination which is achieved by negotiation between governments in which the, whatever we call the UK government is willing to compromise. So I, I'm interested in which of those two visions of devolution you're embracing. I, my, my, answer, so, so, yeah, my, my answer, John, is that you, you would define in statute um, the, re, the, the responsibilities of devolved administrations, which my, my personal view should be the metro, metro mayors with, with a, some sort of consistency over the powers that they have in the main conurbations and unitary and county authorities in the non-met areas, I would scrap um, district councils in their entirety. Um, and, uh, and you look at the county, mine in Bucks, Dorset, Wiltshire, Cornwall, the, the move is in that direction. Um, greater clarity uh, uh, of purpose. But you, I would give an enabling power then for those authorities to form, if they chose, combined authorities with their neighbours to cover things like strategic planning or perhaps transport, where there was an obvious 
um, uh, synergy in the working together. Um, and the way I would see it working is that in some respects, uh, the local sub-regional authorities would be acting as sort of agents of central government, but with some with flexibility over interpretation. So net zero, it seems to me, that is an objective that you set at United Kingdom level. It, it isn't at the moment. No, no, no. well, it except the, you, right. except it, well, it is in that the, there is an act Scottish, of... The, 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 an act the, of Scot the Scottish yeah. government is committed to net zero by 2045, rather yeah. than 2050. Yes. You, well, I think Scot Scotland, because you've already got a devolution statute in place, and Wales, Wales Northern too, um, is slightly different. And I think what, what you make a perfectly fair point, John, because in many of these policy areas, the, um, the government of the United Kingdom acts as the government of England, and there's sort of a separate, very interesting question, probably haven't got time for, on how Whitehall and Westminster need to configure themselves to deal with specifically English interests and English matters. Um, but uh, when it comes to whether, how you deliver net zero in Manchester and how you deliver net zero in Cornwall probably require different, different solutions, and you need to devolve um, some discretion on that, in part because you then benefit from innovation and experiment. Uh, that actually, you know, you, you tried everything from Whitehall, probably there'll be lethargy, you know, inertia, you won't actually move very fast, and, and, and the risk of something going wrong on a grand scale is also greater. Um, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom, let's try things out. There are other things where I would, personally, I would go further. Um, I remember talking to Andy Burnham about um, some elements of criminal justice. It seemed, I, I think there's a perfectly good case, perhaps starting with private projects, to say crime prevention, non-custodial sentences, rehabilitation, um, perhaps even low security prisons, I don't think high security prisons, could go down to that sub-regional level and let them sort you know, devise solutions there. Because again, what, what is right for Sussex or Northumberland is not necessarily going to be what works in Liverpool. Okay, now, We've got 20 minutes for Q&A, and I reckon we've got a pretty hotted up um, <laughs> John and David, who are virtually ready for anything. Now, who would like in here, and we'll move to online in a moment, who would like to ask the first question? A lady straight ahead of me in the one, two, three, four, fifth row. With a microphone heading in your direction. Uh, so my question goes back to the um, original question of the lecture, if I may. <laughs> um, I think uh, many people in the room will be aware of a judicial review that was um, put, that w a newspaper called Tortoise applied for, which uh, basically challenged the procedure of the Conservative Party um, to elect the leader in the way that they did. One of the main arguments that they made in that challenge was that the way in which um, people became members of the Conservative Party was uh, not transparent at all. And the procedure in which the election happened, th there was effectively no oversight. So my question is very procedural in the sense that without any oversight into the way that parties, which are not subjected to you know, judicial review, strictly speaking, yeah. um, uh, conduct their elections, how, why not protect it through the constitution or what other ways can we do that since they're not subject to the same public law principles? Okay, so John. Okay, um, I think first of all to say I, I decided not to get into the weeds of, uh, as it were, the operationalization of party membership ballots. Uh, there are question marks that can be raised within both our two uh, mm -hmm. largest parties. I mean, in the case of the Labour Party, for example, the, the fact that it decided to open up um, the ballots in 2015 and after 2015 to registered supporters and not just members. In a sense, you can argue that there's a, there's a, there, there is at least a, a logical argument that says, I am a member of an institution, an institution is going to have a new leader, therefore the members of that institution should be able to elect it. Though, of course, in the case of the Labour Party, because of its somewhat federal structure, you know, who is and isn't a member of the Labour Party has always been a somewhat, shall we say, fuzzy subject. Um, so I, I, I grant you, and that of course raises, does raise another wider issue. Um, and again, I'm, I'm sure I'll get corrected in this room if I'm wrong, but basically until 
the passage of the Political Parties Elections and Referendums Act of 2000 or whatever it is, political parties in this country were basically unincorporated organizations uh, and there was no legal regulation at all. Uh, we do now have uh, we've seen quite a lot of legal regulation, particularly the finances of parties. Uh, part of it was introduced in, in, in the belief that if you regulate the parties more and force them to be transparent, then you would increase the uh, level of trust. To be honest, I think the problem with regulating political parties is, uh, or indeed some of the other things about you know, uh, transparency of interest in the House of Commons, all the rest of it, is you basically create tripwires that politicians are guaranteed to fall over um, and also then to, cr to cry foul at each other when one side or the other trips over the wire. Um, and actually doesn't do anything for trust because you just make it, you know, and people come to the conclusion that politicians can't keep to the rules in general. So, I, so I'm therefore somewhat wary about going down the road of increasing regulation. So again, I suppose, although I grant you perhaps my proposal is something of a fig leaf in terms of, you know, would MPs be willing to overturn something? But at the end of the day, um, certainly when it comes to a, an, an election which results potentially in a change of prime minister, you know, I want to steep the MPs' blood in the process so that they take responsibility uh, uh, for what's happened. Otherwise, um, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, uh, political parties will regulate themselves effectively, but I grant you if they don't, then maybe we will have to regulate them more, but I think it comes with at least as many downsides as it does upsides. Okay, thank you for that. Now, moving online, Mark Higgins uh, asked this question of David Liddington. David Liddington talks about the insufficiency of conventions, but surely the problem with the 2017-2019 Parliament was that the convention about votes of no confidence had been superseded by statute. Did not that act allow a House of Commons with no confidence in Theresa May to pretend it had confidence in Theresa May for its own political purposes? David. I think, I think that, the, I think as I tried to say earlier, I think that the Fixed Term Parliament Act showed its flaws uh, during that period. And I think that the, what we were in was a situation where Theresa was not able to call a general election herself to try to resolve the matter and go to the country to argue for the, uh, the form of Brexit that she advocated. It did not, Parliament did not vote for a general election, which was the only way of going to, uh, to the country um, since that prerogative power had been removed. And Parliament at the same time voted against any of the options for, uh, for Brexit at a time when we were up against a deadline under the Article 50 procedure of the EU treaties. So it you know, led to situations where we kept on having to ask for an extension um, you know, by grace of the EU to, so because we, we hadn't come to a decision. So, I mean, I, I agree with the, the question of... Uh, my, my, my point about uh, the erosion of, of conventions uh, goes further. I think, first of all, you could go a long way back um, I, I look at the way in which uh, the use of guillotine motions became more frequent and then under the Blair government program motions were introduced as a rule for all legislation. And while I don't, don't uh, miss, well, when I was in the house, I don't, didn't miss the, you know, sitting till two, three o'clock, seven o'clock even in the morning. Um, I do, I, mean, I know that there were occasions when important elements in bills were just not debated or were debated for a very brief period of time only that didn't do them justice because that suited the convenience of the government of the day and the programme motion was written to make it easy for them to squeeze out unwelcome debates and unwelcome amendments. But then what we had from uh, July 2019 onwards was the prorogation case, which was, uh, I do think, um, a major challenge which drew the monarchy into politics because it involved advice being given to the late Queen, uh, Balmoral, Bauer, Bauer and, and, and her present, presented with uh, advice which the Supreme Court basically said was null and void afterwards. It drew the court then, by virtue of that unanimous judgment, 
into issues that I think most of us, even those of us who thought that the prorogation ruse was uh, a disgrace, had not believed um, fell subject to judicial supervision. I remember talking to Dominic Grieve the day before the amendment. We both thought that it's a really bad political decision, but we couldn't see the Supreme Court deciding that it was actually justiciable. We thought that they, they think it was a, it, it may be wrong, but it was political in, in, in substance. So the courts got more, more drawn, drawn in there. And then there's a separate set of issues about the relationship between um, politicians in government and civil servants and the uh, way in which um, a, a significant number of permanent secretaries and very other senior civil servants were elbowed out of the way and the way in which, particularly during Dominic Cummings' time uh, at number 10, I, mean, I know officials who, who said that they were being, they, well, they described to me, their word was bullied, uh, to do things that went way beyond what an apolitical professional civil servant ought to be doing. Sir John. Well, I, just to remark that, of course, that arguably a lot of the conventions of British politics has relied on what we might call the good chap yeah. good chapesses uh, mm. theory of behaviour. And without trying to get too political, um, I think some of the criti critics of uh, recent Conservative governments have felt that they are no longer willing to follow those conventions. Indeed, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the con current Conservative administration, particularly its attitudes towards the civil service, is it reminds one of the views of the Benites in the 60s and the 70s, that the civil service were working against the interests of Labour governments. Well, now it's in the opposite direction. It is now intriguing the Conservative governments, whom you might think would wish to conserve the principles of the British Constitution, who at the moment seem least enamoured of following the good chaps and chapesses rules of government. Gosh, we're moving on to dangerous ground. Yes. <laughs> Next question, right at the back, please. A microphone is heading in your direction, tiptoeing in your direction, slowly moving in your direction, about to arrive. Over Thank to you. you. Can I ask a question about the status of party elected leaders in our constitution? Uh, the premise of this question, the question for debate and much of the argument uh, has been that our prime minister, our head of government, must be the elected leader of a registered political party. Firmly sailed, and that save possibly for uh, a caretaker administration such as that of 1834, there is no possibility uh, of someone other than a party elected leader uh, being the head of government in this country. And is that constitutional convention, if it now is, the reason why we have to ask the question in the first place? John. Well, I think you give, give, give me another reason as to why you might want to embrace my proposal of letting MPs elect um, a, a leader. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the leader wasn't legally recognised until the PPRA. Um, right. um, there is no requ the, the only requirement is that the leader should maintain the conf have the confidence of the House of Commons. And if particularly um, we end up in a situation in where we have a badly hung parliament, and we maybe get two hung parliaments, so resorting to another election just isn't going to be the way out of whatever deadlock. It may well be um, that uh, two or three more parties may be willing to agree that somebody yes, other than the leader would be acceptable to both, either leader of parties will be acceptable uh, to both sides. And if we open up the election, uh, open up who becomes prime minister to an elective process, then it makes it possible uh, indeed to go down that route if you wish to do so. Fascinating. In October 74, I fought that election under a proposal from Ted Heath that if elected, he was going to have a government of all the talent, oh, indeed, yeah, inviting yeah. in yeah. all sorts of other political parties yeah. and independent people. Fascinating. And actually, he did really better than most people expected him to do, but he still lost. And of course, in the end, Howard Wilson had to introduce the liberal talent into his yes. government. Mm. That's right. With the Lib Lab. Well, that was Callaghan. Callaghan, sorry. Callahan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question, gentlemen there. <clears throat> My lords, um, I'm going back to the original question as well, like <laughs> the other lady. Um, if you, as you said in the beginning, that those unelected 
prime ministers. Uh, like, I'm not going to Lord North, but from the upper Balfour to Alec Douglas Hume, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, I am, I'll come back to that. They have been all unsuccessful, if you look at their history. All those people, those who are uh, elected on that basis. But the, we are ignoring <clears throat> the fundamental question the Prime Minister exercises extraordinary prerogative powers and then to govern the country. And our Boris Johnson used Henry VIII powers to overturn parliamentary processes. And <clears throat> PM also in abroad uh, um, presides, sorry, attends G7, G20, NATO conferences, economic forum, and also decides <clears throat> declare war and peace. Okay. So these are very serious questions. And the Kriya Starma last week challenged Rishi Sunak where he gets the mandate. So these are the very important questions because that reflects the whole commonwealth <coughs> of nations. I'm sorry, I've got a cold. Yeah, nations. And they follow our tradition of the uh, democratic system, the parliamentary de democratic system. And this is where I think, and I go back to Lord Liddington, there is a high time in 400 years that we should have a constitutional reform. Oh, okay, David. I think, I think that the, the, I mean, the charge of where does your mandate comes, come from has come from every leader of the opposition, regardless of party, to any new prime minister mid-term, regardless of party. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it, it, it's a standard sort of bit of political trade. Um, I, I, well, I understand the point you're making. My, my, uh, my answer to you would be that the, the mandate of Rishi Sunak now or any of his predecessors going back to Arthur Balfour derives from the fact that they were able to enjoy a majority of members of the House of Commons, sufficient to get legislation through and to have supply in the form of taxation voted for uh, the purposes of government. And I, I, I think the, the, if, if the alternative, you know, I think John, John Curtis's point about having a positive parliamentary vote is a perfectly fair one, and I, I do not object to that at all. But I, I think that the idea that you would have to have a fresh general election if the prime minister you know, suffered a, uh, a, a, an incapacitating stroke or heart attack, let us say, um, is, is not uh, uh, an innovation that would actually help the good government of the country. I just sure. simply remark, I'm not sure we can draw the conclusion that, that people who become prime ministers without being elected are necessarily a failure. I mean, Winston Churchill is the obvious. Mm. example yeah. which you, know, you would cite in the opposite direction. No, I mean, Harold Macmillan, I think most people yeah. would say, had a perfectly successful uh, period in government. Mm. So there we are. Now, have we got a final question? Yes, gentlemen there. Thank you. Ab absolutely fascinating to, to hear all this. Just want to address what's a hypothetical point, seemingly came very close to passing last summer, during uh, the Boris Johnson leadership crisis, with the with him calling a snap gen poss the possibility of him calling a snap general election possibly changing all the, uh, all the MPs to be people supportive um, and the conflict with the the, the, uh, the Lassell's principles the dragging the dragging the uh, monarch in, into this situation and what could have, uh, have unfolded and how to prevent such a situation particularly because uh, someone such, such as Boris Johnson or someone similar coming back into power. I think it's a challenge for you. No, I think, the, you know, it, 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 and that illustrates, you know, the one of the benefits of having a fixed term rather than the, the flexible term that it would make it impossible for a prime minister to attempt such a thing on a whim. Now, what happened, I think, on, 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 on that occasion was that the... Um, the, the hidden wiring in the constitution worked. I mean, my understanding is that the, the conversations took place between the cabinet secretary and the queen's private secretary. And it, the message was delivered, number 10, that um, Her Majesty would be unavailable to answer the phone 
if the Prime Minister were to, uh, to call to request a, a devolution, but a very strong message that it would be utterly improper to put the sovereign in such a situation. Now, I, I think that um, had Johnson tried that, But that's when I think we came as near as we have done in recent times to um, testing whether the prerogative powers of the sovereign you know, are still can be exercised personally by the sovereign, because in those circumstances where you know, that something like 60 ministers had resigned from the government, and more were following by the hour, this, I would argue the sovereign would have been entitled to so I need to test whether somebody else can form a government. No, I, I mean, entirely agree, but I also, it's one of the reasons why, uh, despite the limitations of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, I would not leave the power of dissolution entirely in the hands of the Prime Minister. Okay, Sir Geoffrey. The Treasurer has arrived. <laughs> and he knows what his homework is because the video of this will be available soon or very soon. But he's asked me to do this bit. Well, I thought this problem was insoluble. Now, coming to the contributions of our speakers, it may still be insoluble. But it's worth noting that both Sir John and Sir David extolled the values of our members of parliament. And I guess at the moment some of us are having a bit of trouble doing that as a matter of instinct. But perhaps we should follow. I wondered, it's a question I'll ask them at their three tables, which, to which they're going for a drink <laughs> almost immediately. I mean, what would happen if a party needing a new prime minister had a system, I don't care which one, for putting up two, three candidates, and the whole house then voted on them? Well, at least you'd have something of an opinion of the electorate as a whole. But I'm sure there are a thousand one reasons for objecting to that as a solution. They've also, in a way, um, and I, before I come to thank them, this is by way of a trailer. They've also uh, supported the continuing function of the adversarial system, alive, kicking, and so much admired at Prime Minister's Question Time around the world. And of course, the adversarial system operates not just in politics, but also in the law. And you, some of you, I hope, be interested to know that the next event in this series in June is going to discuss that very issue, the adversarial system that permeates our constitutional machinery, the law and parliament, and come to, the, and come to think about whether it's still a very good thing to, do, to have. So back to our speakers, what a feast we have had, uh, gentlemen. Uh, you have not held back. You have stimulated us all to think more about what our entitlements are under our constitution, which does exist, and how, if at all, things might be improved. Thank you all very much for coming and talking to us. And after the, sh the round of applause that will follow, you'll get a drink.